So, um, I'm going to call this pre-session to order. It's October 15, 2024. And this is very informal for the people who are here. It's just a way for counselors to talk to each other, give updates on uh, the meetings that they are, boards and commissions that they are liaisons to, and what's going on. So, um, we'll do a low call real fast. Um, Joan Peck. No titles in this. <laughs> she keep it going. Marshall Martin. Sandy Cedar. <clears throat> Francis Jackie. John Quintana. Teresa Moy. Eugene May. Carol Rodriguez. Sean McCoy. Aaron Rodriguez. Susie Valgo Perry. And Diane Christ is ill tonight, so she won't be here. So uh, we're just going to do the updates. Um, and at the very last minute, I have done send out, send out uh, Diane's updates through email because she's not here. So you may not get them until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm going to start in what are these things? Um, these are uh, the Metro mayors in their uh, meetings have said that they are getting a lot of very angry. Uh, people at their meetings and the counselors are becoming angry with each other and so they the the head the chair of Mer metro mayors reached out and said anything that we can do to going into this toxic time after the election possibly of how do we treat our residents how do we talk to each other um so i went online and you don't have to follow this but it's um Basically, one of them is about uh, in intelligence to reclaim civility. And I think as leaders in our city, we need to show uh, how we interact with each other and um, with our residents. So it is, this isn't appointed to anybody. I'm just going to pass it out. You don't have to follow them or anything, but they're just, uh, one of them is use your emotional intelligence to rec reclaim civility and then promoting civility in our public spaces a crime for local officials. How do we talk to each other? How do we talk to residents? And um, You were so very appropriate. Thank I know. you. It was like you read my she mind. Like, <laughs> ah! I don't know how to respond to this. So I'm, I'm going to give, give you one more hours. So I'm just going to put them here, and if you want them, um, grab them and um, kind of keep them in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. oh, you want one? Yeah. Just we can pass them around. Yeah, two of them. Is this it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. There's two of them. There's two of them. But, yeah. I thought that was yeah. six. But if you don't have it, there you go. So, um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's here just to listen, Here's an agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so I see we have public. Um, and the other thing. Over there? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. They're just copies. Okay. So we're here to talk about minimum wage. And the reason that I wanted to talk about minimum wage is that I think it's important for us to hear each other on council on what we think about it, what we want to do. It is really too late. And thank goodness to do anything about it for January of 2025. Um, and I did tell a commissioner who kept emailing me about what are you going to decide, what are you going to decide, mm -hmm. that you know all businesses in the cities included have already done their budgets so uh, for next year. So t for us to change something in that budget, for me, is not, uh, it's not an appropriate thing to do this year. But um, I think that Susie, why don't you tell what you just told me about um, why this one business? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, because um, I had called the mayor asking um, why this was on the agenda to discuss. Um, so I had some, some questions. Since we're not making a decision, it's just really to kind of get feel for where everybody's at with this. Um, so I had an opportunity to speak with the owner of Bikes and what's the name? Spice and bikes. Spice. Yes, and um, she was at the um, at the sustainable, resilient Longmont um, electric 
Whipple event. And she was mentioning how with the state rolling out the rebates for their um, the EVs, she has to wait several months before she gets reimbursed for that. So that has added an additional constraint. And so as we were looking at, okay, what are, you know, as we are making decisions that have potential impacts to, to business owners, how can we balance what are some of the nuances, what are some, some of the challenges that they're already experiencing, and um, making sure that what we do doesn't provide an added burden, but how, how we can kind of support that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, so that, that raised some concerns to me. So then immediately after I left that booth, I went over to the state of Colorado booth to talk to them <laughs> about what are they doing to streamline the process. There's a lot of red tape happening. I believe they're making some changes that will be in, occurring in January that will allow them to get their um, funds faster and um, or some kind of grant grant opportunities. I don't have the specific details, but I did collect her, her information. So I, you know, I said, as this starts rolling out, please contact contact me, and I gave her my information so we can address that. But so those are those are some of the nuances that I wanted to to, to consider. Okay. At uh, the coffee with council that Marcia and I attended, there were quite a few folks that uh, uh, came and spoke. It was right after the unity of the community event. Uh, the night before, and so uh, you know they they were feeling that uh, this uh, it had been tough enough to get through COVID, and then they were getting to the situation where they were at a point where uh, they felt like they were kind of finally kind of getting somewhat of their sea legs back underneath them, and then this sort of conversation comes up, and they're you know they're finding it hard to uh, to to think that they would be able to survive this one uh, and it's we've seen before you know downtown we've got this vibrant downtown and you know, we've seen before some uh, uh, economic downturns that have really hurt the community and so you know a couple of them uh, were business owners that just felt like they didn't want to see that again they felt like things were finally getting a place where people could actually run a business downtown and be successful. I uh, reached out to um, Vic Bella from the Latino uh, Voices, mm -hmm. and um, this made me kind of sad because I said, "I can you get a group together of business owners of the Latinx Latino population, as well as residents? I would like to talk to them about the minimum wage. What do you think it's going to be?" And he, he called me back, he said, Joan, I can't get anybody to do because they're telling me they're going to do what they want anyway, they don't pay any attention to us. And that made me really sad, because um, that's not true. Um, so he said, I'm still trying, so it's going to be a while before, but I will go to one of their meetings and just bombard them. Russia. I think that and obviously we miss the window this year. Yes. Um, and everyone is kind of breathing a sigh of relief that we missed the window this year. And, um, I think doing it in the year of the presidential election is probably a um, bad plan from the start. Um, <coughs> I think that the county commissioners took the wrong approach. They tried to put a forcing function on us. Mm -hmm by saying, we're going to do it, and you guys are going to follow along with the little reps. Um, I strongly believe that we have to raise the minimum wage um, because in the interest of social justice. Uh, and everybody, you know, it's ironic that we have a civility letter here, because the letters that I've been receiving, and they're pretty much the same that everyone's been receiving, mm -hmm. you know, if you just take away some of the civility words. They're saying, my business won't survive unless I can exploit the people on the bottom and pull the wool over the people on, uh, on, over the eyes on, the, on the, the next tier, you know, the second lowest group of people, because otherwise they won't be making enough more. 
Well, you know, there's no justice in that. It's wrong. But we have to find a way to make the change happen in a way that will be acceptable. Because we all know from studying history and economics that there have been times when we had better balance between <coughs> what things cost people and what they earned. And so we know that businesses work that way. And what we've had is a period of time in business where profits were squeezed um, kind of up to the top, like a toothpaste tube. And, and we need to change that. But I think what we need to do is change it um, from the bottom up. We need to build in one of those little pieces of tubes, you know, that you put on the bottom of your toothpaste so that you roll it up. That means training our businesses so that they understand they, they're going to, they all those letters say in five years it's going to be $25 an hour and they're assuming that all the other factors in their business are held constant. Well, that's not what's going to happen, you know. So I think the, the city doesn't have enough money. My original idea was that we should teach them. You know, well, we don't have the money to run the Longmont University for the next few years. Um, if ever, but I think that we need to put, get progressive businesses together and find ways uh, for businesses to support each other and have institutions that will, that will help. You know, the large primary employers already know that the economics of a higher minimum wage are favorable to their businesses. And so, okay, you guys, are, if this happens and this economy gets hotter um, so that your businesses drag more money out of the rest of the economy and into Longmont, which is what a primary employer is for, um, then that means, <coughs> you know, you need to pay the piper a little bit and find ways to help these mom and pop businesses that feel like they're going to die, um, not die. You know, need to find need to find um, ways to help them by, you know, a collective business promotion. You know, advertising is a big cost for a small business. Well, if if that gets collectivized, the way the DDA, for example, tries to do, or is it Longmont tries to do? those get more effective, then, then those businesses lose a cost, and so they can pay it as a wage instead. We need, to, you know, we need to spend some time, and probably two years, not one, um, two years re-educating our businesses and changing the, cult, the business culture so that it becomes possible. That's what I think, because I think we should be ashamed of ourselves if we don't get it done. So, um, we are not changing counselors this year. We'll have the same group of people. Um, I think that overall, it's a good group. And I agree that we need to, we should, along with the county, raise the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. The $25 an hour does not even have to be part Conversation. That is exactly what the commissioner said. Um, you know, even voted didn't, didn't uh, adopt that. Uh, Lafayette is waiting to see what we do, so they didn't do anything. Um, but I do think we need to address it, and we have a year because uh, next year we should think about what we're going to do and let uh, let the business community know if you agree that that we are going to consider raising that minimum wage so that they can prepare their budgets there. But I did hear from um, Kimberly McGee when we went to the site selection dinner that she's very nervous that some of her small restaurants have said that they would just go to bread with a fire stone. Um, will they do that? I don't know. Is that a threat? I don't know. Um, they don't know. Um, and I, I believe that could have happened this year. Also, if Frederick or Firestone or both get DDAs of their own, 
which would help them in an abstract to for for marketing or whatever. And if they don't raise their minimum wage, that would be a selling point for someone to move. If they go to a different DDA where the minimum wage is static. Um, so I guess what I think that we should do is really think about it this year and how we want to go about it. Because I do think next year we have to we have to really make a decision by October. So by October. Uh, at the end of the month I'm at the Consortium of Cities uh -huh. and we have other topics to discuss there, but one of the topics is this and I just want to make sure I'm getting the flavor of this that we're not going to make any decisions uh, at, at, at this point uh, before the end of the year. So um, that, just that in general is there. Uh, and uh, anything else you'd like me to make sure I, I report? It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's the consensus of us. Yeah. Why we're but there. I'm just saying yeah. in general that we were kind of, you know, we're still trying to feel it out. Well, me personally, I don't think we're trying, I'm not trying to fill it out. I think we need to get, see what kind of system that we can help the businesses because I too believe that we need to increase minimum wage. Yes, yeah. I, I think that's the main that. thing that do we agree upon increasing minimum wage. But what we also need to agree upon, how are we going to do it? That's, that's, that's and so, that's strong. I know from the businesses that I have talked to, have, um, had, that had translated to me that they're looking at that $25 an hour. I know. And that's scary. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely scary. Okay. And we do have businesses within our city who are hanging on by a thread. And just the thought of that is scary for them and almost make them look elsewhere. Um, whether they move or not, it's still an option for them if they do that. Um, but we also want our community to know that we are supporting them and we yes. also want our businesses to know that we're supporting them as well. So how do we create this system um, that will be as equitable and fair for our citizens and also our businesses? Mm -hmm. You know, I know you were saying, Marsha, to educate the businesses. I think businesses know how to increase wages is how they can do it and be sustainable mm -hmm. and still be operational and be able to save money and to buy product and then we're charging for um, recycling and compost all these things um, so I mean but yet e even me myself can't even afford any more than my regular essentials of rent Insurance is sky high, and food is sky high. So with the with the wages that most people earn here in Colorado, let alone Boulder County, it's not sustainable. So I know for myself, I think it's a must that we have to increase minimum wage, but we also have to sit down and figure out with the chamber and other businesses mm -hmm. and also the community, how can we create a system where it could be sustainable, where we are supporting as many as we can in an equitable way. Erin, yeah. yeah. do you have anything to add? Okay. I just, when we discussed this last time, I thought you had made a motion. Yeah. I thought we had a motion that we would be having a kind of a round table or some kind of chamber or oh, local fish business, fishbowl, fish 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 yes. with us. So I thought prior to us making any decisions we going forward, to do that we were going to do that first. Yes, yeah, I do know that um, Scott Cook has been putting that together. Okay. Oh, you so um, um, uh, we're just waiting to see how he gets that okay. done and when he, he's able to. Um, because do. that's going to address the how do we get there. Yes. And yeah. So you know, just to, to clarify, I do believe that mm -hmm. that we people are not making enough for the cost of living. I agree with you. However, how do we move from philosophical and ideological, and what, what I view as something right, how do we move this into sustainable policy and practices? We need so a strategy. We need a strategy. So that's that's what I want to see first. Yeah. I'd like to just, I know I've spoken already, but interject a couple of things. One is I think we should look hard at the model of unions, because they 
do risky things like this by protecting each individual by sharing costs. Right? You know, they have stuff like grocery funds so that they can have strikes. Um, and, you know, people, people can lose pay and not starve their families. Um, and so there are, there are not that this is identically the same, but there could be some institutions that we don't have now that would, um, if our commercial communities participated in them, uh, then uh, changing the balance between um, incomes and costs Marcia, would be possible. Back on that? Yeah, exactly yeah. Good. Well, I'm I'm glad. And the other thing is on the on the subject of the <coughs> move to Frederick threat. Just want to get this out, and then I'll let Sean talk. But <coughs> what? Go ahead. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, on the move to Firestone thing, uh, you know. We can get one of our little data analysts to have a Google project where you get to spend 10 hours a week on it. They have to figure out how much it's going to cost a small business to relocate to Firestone and how many years of their margins it's going to cost them. And then we can find out whether that's a real threat for, say, a restaurant or a bar. Because I'm kind of thinking it's probably not. I would agree with you. I, I did some research on this and looked at the Bureau of Labor and Statistics about construct, uh, two sector, sectors of the, uh, the economy that we should be maybe looking at in regards to that and trying to promote, and that would be the construction trades aspect of unionization, and the second one, because of AI coming in, the technology and computer programming trades, because both of those are, one of the, are two of the main staples that we have going here in Longmont. We have you know, a lot of construction going on, and we have a lot of high-tech uh, businesses in, in Longmont and in the surrounding area, and we really need to, to focus on that. But I think that also uh, ties into the idea of, you know, how do we get that, keep that that workforce here, and that's maybe talking about ADUs a little bit, and the, the uh, way we regulate uh, corporate investors purchasing our housing here so that we can get uh, folks where it's these all these things seem to be tied in together your our ability to, to house people is is being uh, stressed our ability to uh, to uh, uh, make sure that people don't have wage theft in regards to uh, uh, and uh, have consistency in the price of, of what it costs to maybe at, from a labor standpoint to employ people for uh, construction and everything. Of course, the, the issue around uh, um, you know technology, when we have such a huge population involved in that industry, we want to make sure that, uh, that, that AI doesn't just wipe them out someday and we are all up here going, you know, wringing our hands trying to figure out why, uh, what we could have done. What we could have done is help do this. And, and then, uh, you know, we have to start addressing that housing issue that because it, they, they aren't just sitting here in silos and isolation. They're, they're actually, you know, intertwined to the point where we have to figure out how do we make these, uh, 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 make it more uh, doable for people. If we're going to talk about uh, helping them get across the finish line, whether it be the, you know, even in, even in a minimum wage situation, do we want to promote education too as a teacher I kind of like that idea that we have a, a training wage but we also have a minimum wage for people who have certifications like you know people that can work in daycares and stuff like that uh, you know they all have some sort of uh, first aid CPR or you know some sort of uh, background checks and things like that to do the job and so we we need to maybe make sure that that's tied into the minimum Sean, how do they already do that? When well, people are hired, there's yeah. you hire them on different levels of education and position. Right? I well, that, that's fine there, but I'm just saying maybe we need to help encourage what Marsha was saying more unionization in some of these areas it might stabilize some things. Unions have apprenticeships. Yeah. Yes. Can I just say one more thing? Yeah. I do, I want the record to to show and state that we know that the city is paying, our city and the city employees are getting paid above the minimum wage. 
as which most businesses are paying above minimum wage unless they are high school students um, that we do know of. Um, you know, as you mentioned, child care workers, they are not getting paid what they need to be getting paid to take care of somebody else's kids. And we also know that, that the child care industry is so extremely expensive that parents are saying some parents have to stay home because they can't afford to take care, take their kids to daycare. And so you got that, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And we can't, I we know can't that. solve all these problems. We cannot, but it's all, it's it's all, all intertwined. Yes, it is. Yes. So two things that Marta Lunchman uh, stated that I thought were very good points. Number one, the minimum wage allows that no one would ever fall below that. So some people are making uh, more, a lot of people are making more in today's environment. But it just it just ensures that nobody will fall below this level. Um, you can't hire anybody below the level, uh, whatever whatever the that is. Um, and the other thing, what was the other thing? I just lost it. Um, I'll think about it. So um, I I just think that that's something to keep in mind when we. Our point is that no one should ever fall below this level. Um, I don't know that we have anything else to add other than let's think about it this year, uh, talk to Scott, talk to businesses, let them know we're thinking about it so that they will, um, that if, if in further conversations, council says yes, absolutely, we need to raise the minimum wage next year, then we can go in strong and uh, the city knows what we're going to do, it won't just be Put it to a vote of the people, is that what you mean? No, not necessarily. Um, the other thing that I, I was very frustrated with, with what the commissioners did, is that we are a very different city than Boulder is. Boulder has a lot of money. We do not. We have a huge Latino uh, population. We don't have the university bringing in dollars. Um, so. I feel that we do have a lower population, socioeconomic population, that needs to have a minimum wage security. So that's all I have to say. We can also contact the neighborhood if you do so. Oh, yeah, and yeah. yeah, I'm not on it. And GLA? And GLA. I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be here. That is, I know. So I'm oh, okay. Starting this Thursday. Did you know that? <laughs> so I flipped it so that the people here were interested in the minimum wage discussion. So uh, let's get Borden. Uh, uh, yes. So it's uh, Shakita and, and, and uh, Diane going for a copy of the council. What's happening? Yeah, this is in GLA on Saturday. You're having something special. It's not So, if minimum wage comes out, we'll make it. We're working on it. So, um, and there is no public invite to be heard here. So, uh, we should have a session with your fishbowl that you are putting together. Thank you. So, um, I, get, I can go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I just have a couple of uh, real interesting board Great. things Great. going on. Um, I, the reason I came back so early, because I've been always planning to be here next week for the final budget budget vote, um, was that Lisa Knobloch said, I need somebody who's not afraid to tell the truth to the Sustainability Advisory Board, because mm -hmm. they are doing things that are, or wanting to do things that are um, uh, insensitive to the process that the city has to go, go through, uh, and mm -hmm. insensitive to our relationship with PRPA, and insensitive to um, long-term objectives like building efficiency that the city has. And they've got really varied political people 
and then some of the usual suspects that are just trying to be inclusive, um, but they don't understand the problem well enough that, that you know you can include matter and antimatter and be inclusive. You've got to come down on one side or the other. Um, and so I'm going to be there. Okay. Um, Good. Because um, you know if if we don't, they're going to bring some. Uh, Resolutions to council that I think are what exactly um, um, telling PRPA that they need to go back to the drawing board on the IRP after they've already submitted it to WAPA mm -hmm. and you know stuff like stuff like that um, and based on on you know unscientific stuff. Harold actually had an interesting idea that maybe the board could be reorganized so that uh, they, you know, so there was an energy segment that went that way, and there there was a, a, a code and for you know building codes built uh, that went with <coughs> I don't know planning and zoning, um, except that that's not advisory, so I don't know how that would work, but. Rather than put, because everything is sustainability, you know. I mean, we should have the, we should have the, no, we should. Well, I don't know how. You, when you want to reorganize something, you start stop and think about how you're going to reorganize it, right? So I'll have a suggestion. But the thing is, the thing is that that everything we do has those three pillars now. You know, people, planet, profit, or you know, cost versus the, the environment versus um, uh, affordability for the people, economic affordability for the people. And um, so maybe that function needs to be redistributed among different operational groups within the city. I don't know. Um, and I have a question for Eugene. Um, we don't. It's just the counselors. What? Just the counselors' staff yeah. isn't involved in our discussions. Oh, you mean he can't talk? No, it's just among us, so that we outside or inside of the center. Okay. Center well, we then, can talk. But then I will say okay. that um, we need clarification boiled down, maybe in a, in a rules matrix or stuff. Because one of the things that the Sustainability Board is trying to do is change their rules. Um, what's doing that? I'm sorry. It's okay. I don't like know. It's cute, no, but that? it's <laughs> disruptive. <laughs> um, so. But, uh, you know, so they're trying to change their rules, and some of the rule changes that they want to make maybe are not allowed. Because, you know, some boards are statutory, some are chartered, and we have some things that are functioning like boards that aren't either of those things, and we need to get that straight away. Okay. Um, so that is that is the thing. Um, the other thing is that the airport advisory board is actually being fairly tractable as a board themselves, mm -hmm. you know. But they're they're under a lot of pressure. And the airport is, you know, Levi's under a lot of pressure because um, there are more. Um, uh, flight students than there have been for a long time. Everybody's mad about touch and goes, mm -hmm. and in you know I've got dialogues going with a bunch of those the people who are complaining. Again, they mostly start out by writing to the whole council, so you at least read their letters, and they're mostly saying, "Make it go away," and then they say, "We're not taking no for an answer. Make it go away." Um, and we need to um, we need to do something first of all because they don't know the public doesn't know what we are doing and what and that we do have a vision for the airport and that it's just taking longer than we wanted it to but we have done things to promote a more sustainable vision for the airport see there the airport advisory board has a sustainability function and they're handling it properly. Um, and I know that in November there is the, the public discussion, but um, 
I feel like we should be um, we should be helping the board and the public be good and ready for that. Okay. And so you know, that's the other thing is is that I'm doing this week is engaging with the airport advisor. Well, welcome back. It's fun. Um, no trans transportation um, moved moved that meeting to Monday, so I didn't go. I think because um, Phil is out of the country, um, and I was out of the country for the other meeting, so I didn't attend um, LBDA or um, uh, one month sister cities. I was with you at the um, so, so, yeah yeah that was yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't have any updates. That's good. So um, just piggybacking a little bit on what Marcia was saying, uh, PRPA, you know, we've been having, getting a lot of letters that uh, they want a third party oversight review of the IRP uh, from NREL. Uh, it's hard, it's difficult being, treading that line about the residents and, and PRPA because uh, PRPA um, did a lot of work on the IRP. I think they did a lot of good work on the IRP. But it is the residents that put us in, you know, that decided we all needed to go to 100% renewable. So for me, not listening to them totally is inappropriate because it is their city, it is there. So I am going to, um, at the next PRPA meeting, make a motion that we have in real uh, look at it only because I want to I want to see if I get a second and I also want to hear the discussion um, because we don't have making a motion is the only way for it for the board to discuss it otherwise we just shut down and I think that we owe it to the residents if it doesn't pass and I don't think it will um, did they have then the residents from their elected representatives know how the elected representatives feel as a body. Because now all they're getting is from staff, you know, the reports from staff as to what the IRP is and what they did or whatever. Um, they want and deserve, I think, for their elected officials to take a stand. And I think making a motion, having a discussion, and voting on it, number one, I don't think I'm going to get a second. Number two, if I do, we discuss it, it was never going to pass. And then, the, then it's dead. And that's what, I, that's what I'm going to do. Because uh, we can't just keep having the same conversations about the same thing. And then that would tell your board, your advisory board, uh, sustainability board, this is where we stand. Your resolutions aren't going to do anything. You're, this is it. So um, I, I like, I am a person that wants to put things to bed. We either are going to do it and talk about it forever or not. The other thing is Front Range Passenger Rail uh, District is we're having a retreat, half day retreats on Thursday and Friday. It's going to be very interesting, um, and I, uh, um, I'm excited about the way we're going, and at some point, hopefully next week or the week after, we can come back with some news that is specific about the, about the way we're going. Uh, we did go on that site selection um, dinner, and the one, the one business grows when they gave us uh, their update on their, I was very interested because the gentleman who spoke said that they work with cities on building TOD around railroads. They build railroads. They um, they work with railroads. I really want to meet with him. And Erin Fostick said that she would uh, definitely get his name for me because I forgot who it was. Memory. So um, that those are the things that I've been working on, as well as I'm going to be the liaison after NGLA. They're having a retreat on Saturday. So um, 
that's it. I'm having a conversation with Dr. I just emailed Doug Rex to have a one-on-one -on -one with him conversation. He is the director of Dr. Cobb um, because we need a better, so here's my, here's my concern and I want to talk to Dr. Cobb about it, is that we are doing BRT on 287. And in our Mayors and uh, Commissioners Coalition, uh, the Mayor of Broomfield brought up that BRT is supposed to go from Broomfield to Fort Collins. I do not want Boulder County planning on paying from Longmont to Fort Collins because that's Larimer. Mm -hmm. And we brought up that we should have them in our meetings because they're not in Dr. Cog, but they have their own NPL. So they should be able to get federal state grants through their own NPO and not have us working on that. Um, that's been a frustration of mine for a long time, is that we in Boulder County are having the discussions about the, the BRT on the entire 287, but we aren't bringing in the people who are under a different financial structure uh, to see how they're going to pay for it. Do you know, I would like to ask a question about the PRPA vote? We're going to let all of us go around. Okay. Susan. Oh, okay. About your so I'm going to pull up. Do you want anything else? No. Okay. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, actually, I have a couple of other updates that are apart from just my general boards and commissions. I do need to connect with Sandy to select a date, the November 12th, for a council as the idea for a council and youth council um, meeting. I was going to think, I was thinking about that, but we're out at, we're out at the National League of Cities. I'm like, that date just doesn't, so we talked about, so I said that I would connect with um, you and just kind of find out from council, are you all interested in setting some time aside? It could be prior to a city council meeting to meet with the youth, youth council. Might be a good thing to do before. Yeah, prior to, so we, we, we would just come in a little earlier on that day. So I'll work on, with Sandy on setting the dates for that, if you all are interested. Kids talk, so maybe 5.30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so that was, that was um, the youth council one, so we're working on dates. Um, the, let's see, so in some of the updates with RCAB, you know, Charlie Kenamitas is retiring. Retired. Retired. So, um, Yes. So we are, you know, this changing of the, the guard, new leadership coming and stepping forward. So um, I have, um, you know, so just introducing folks to our cab and, and we, there's been some changes on, uh, among the board. And so we're re, re looking at our subcommittee work on composting, zero waste. I believe there is another, I, I'm on the composting one. But then we have different subcommittees that work on different tasks and um, different priorities. So um, what we're doing is we're kind of working in our subcommittees. I'm working on the composting one, and then we'll, we come back together and and we look at our priorities and direction. Um, RCAP wants to go with um, advocacy to the um, county commissioners for policy in the future. Um, arts and public places. The St. Stephen's Church on Maine did um, or is being worked on right now for their, uh, they need a new roof. And um, Arts and Public Places had some artwork <coughs> there. I know the suggestion was, oh, do you want to throw tarps on it? But they actually had to move, go in and move the statues. So I know that did, um, it, that did impact cost to, for removal of these large statues, connect with the artists. I guess there was one artist that had only recently put their artwork up there, and then they had to dismantle it and take it back. So the board decided to go ahead and let them have an extended year of keeping that, rather than going through the process of selection, that they're just going to extend and honor that um, that contract. Um, so that, I think, cost, what was it, 1500 I think, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember. Um, so that, that was, there were was some um, fiscal impacts to that. Um, the other thing is that Arts and Public Places, is um, they've had to pitch in $1,000 to, um, 
resistance to oh to, to do protection of the other the rest of the artwork um, as well as and so what so I, I asked that they had was as these projects start getting put into place and things go down the pipeline if they could just be um, well aware because they would not have had the artist put up that recently installed piece had they known that they were going to do the construction. So if they could kind of let them know um, further ahead of time. Um, and then it also looks like Historic Preservation or the Historical Society and LDDA, LDDA was splitting the cost on the St. Stephen's restoration. So um, I, I just kind of wanted to throw it out there. I was just, and this is my wondering, is um, why, why is, you know, the historical uh, society, they don't, they don't have a lot of means to be able to shell out that kind of money. So that was, that was just uh, my wondering. But, <laughs> but I just wanted to throw it out there publicly. Um, the other thing is that uh, with the homeless regional group, we are meeting tomorrow. And so we are looking at, um, I'm going to make the suggestion that we continue with our meetings. Tomorrow is supposed to be the last meeting, but I feel like we're nowhere near done. Um, we're only now getting a sense of what we want our priorities to be. So whether it be advocacy, <coughs> local, state, and federal level, so looking at policy, support the creation of affordable housing, or provide supportive services. So there's so much stuff that's interwoven that I think to to prioritize or work within silos, it, it's going to be next to impossible. So um, I, I feel like I'm going to ask that we have further, you know, carry our regional group to, to meet more. Um, I, you know, one of the, I did take back feedback that I heard from a couple of council people on what direction we wanted uh, to be going, and we're trying to itemize what everybody had said. I, I think there is some concern around the 1B funding and how that's going to be allocated and, um, and put into place. So as we look at regional groups, I ask that we have some um, feedback or some training on looking at how we set policy through an equity lens. So making sure that what we do or what Superior does is aligning maybe with practices we're already doing with the video project, with um, the suites, with wraparound services. So we want to ensure that each municipality isn't doing something that's going to contradict what the mission of our group has decided to go with. So, um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, we're looking at advocacy. Um, and interweaving support and creation of affordable housing as well as the supportive services because one can't have them back together. Um, last Friday, and then with the core and needs team, and this was another one that kind of goes into the unhoused. So we had a really um, good meeting. Um, we heard from um, Andy Easter. Sorry. Okay, from the um, core. To, uh, speaking about fundus, funding, staffing challenges. So staffing challenges doesn't just mean not being able to hire somebody. It's the time it takes from hiring someone, making sure they're well trained, and then they're able to get out on um, out on the field. So it takes a long time. Um, you know, up to a year it can be. So um, you know, we want to make sure that we have the right people in these positions. Um, and looking at what uh, Michael Homestead, uh, Homesteader is doing with acquiring grants for the sustainability of the core and needs team. Um, currently, I, see, I think they, was, they just received a grant. And it was a big grant, but they, they just sent it in. Um, that will allow us for um, to put in money for FTE and um, Sorry, my notes are all over the place. <laughs> there was a lot that they were doing. So with FTE, making sure we have those clinicians out there and case manager. Um, and it was through the Behavioral Health uh, Administration. So it's providing um, four dollars for um, the budget. So um, yeah, I think that was it. They're going to be presenting at the state or at the federal level. So that was really exciting. Um, 
I think what we're doing with our core and leads team is really uh, paving the way for how we look at public safety and policing in the future and how it, it ties so inter uh, so closely with uh, work that our nonprofits are doing, like Hope Shelter and um, mental health uh, mental health partners. Uh, well, you know, that kind of leads in the mind that I'll ask you. That. Okay. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's been a few months since we've done one of these. I know. Uh, Housing and Human Services met in July. Uh, they did not meet in August, and they met in September, as well as October. Uh, in July was when they made the initial request uh, to City Council to consider the down payment assistance program, which obviously Council gave direction on. Uh, so after that, they've really been gearing up because they're now in the thick of their funding request hearings. And I believe after screening, uh, 53 organizations uh, were granted hearings. And so they, they've gone through a couple weeks so far and they've got about three or four more on that. Um, planning and zoning was off last month. Uh, the last thing they heard in August was the Westview concept plan amendment, which we've already, we've already voted on. And then uh, tomorrow night, uh, they will be considering the remand of the McDonald's decision that we sent back to them. Okay. Should be interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, consortium of cities at the end of the month, and it's uh, so that it's not too uh, distant uh, in our thinking process about homelessness. Uh, uh, and uh, Christine Pacheco gave me a was the PowerPoint to present to them. And so that, we'll be talking about the minimum wage and uh, <coughs> Boulder County updates. Um, as far as uh, uh, the uh, Callahan house, I filled in during the summer to do that, and they had a tea just uh, about a week or so ago. And then they had, uh, they're also still doing, their uh, getting their video for the, uh, hopefully they can get into the Colorado experience. Uh, uh, on PBS, uh, they're doing some voiceovers right now. As far as uh, as uh, the golf course, they haven't met in two months. Um, I guess no news is good news. Uh, so uh, they're supposed to meet this month, um, and so um, we probably have heard about something if, if it happened. Um, and you all got the updates in regards to the second quarter with uh, Longmont Public Media, and so uh, that. And then just last night we had uh, the uh, uh, parks and open space, and we talked about this is the thing that is going to come up. And uh, I emailed uh, Jim Golden about it, and they're going to go to a new system, or when they charge people uh, at the door, uh, if you use cash or or check, you'll. Uh, to let's say get into the pool or into the ice cream rink, it'll be whatever the price is. But if you use the credit card, it'll be uh, 3%. And so it'll be, let's say, $7 and whatever 3% is on that. And uh, and that's um, something that I emailed Jim Golden about to see if somebody have, if they don't have, let's say, a, a uh, pass. Would they have uh, a ACH or some sort of thing like that? I uh, I also include uh, David Bell on this so that he could because he's the one that's kind of the point person on this to explain what's going on. But uh, there's a concern from the board that maybe that would would raise a few folks' uh, blood pressure in regards to that point of sale. We were losing literally a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Covering that that uh, that charge at the bank, so it's it's you know it's a, it's a it's you know it's it's an employee or a couple of employees, and so uh, so we have to think about that. So we they're looking at going in that direction, where at point of sale, when you use a credit card or debit card, it'll be added to it. So that's a, that's going to be a big deal. And then of course. Uh, uh, Timber talked about park health, and of course, when we got an email today, and I forwarded that. Uh, uh, you know, we have some some degrees of how things wear out and, and uh, playgrounds and stuff like that. 
and then when Mar since Marsh has been out, I have attended the last two airport advisory board meetings, and in the meantime, they had their uh, their air show on uh, September uh, 13th, 16th, 14th, uh, but uh, that seemed to be quite the success. Uh, of course, uh, you know, the modern West 1 and 2 issues are still moving there and will be up for other discussion. And uh, uh, so those are the biggest. So, yes, um, PRPA, um, uh, doing the IRP, there was a lot of public pressure for PRPA to do an all-dispatchable IRP, or, I'm sorry, RFP, and uh, they, PRPA didn't want to do it, and we're saying aeroderivative turban, aeroderivative turban. But then they did yield to public pressure and do issue uh, an all dispatchable RFP. But then when the RFP came, IRP came around, aerodynamic turbine. What did the board consider in between? Or were you presented with a, a decision? Or was the procurement completely internal? Do you even know, do you know how many um, alternative bids they? Received and were they all for gas turbines or were they for something else? You know, I don't. Um, the reason I'm hesitating is that the time between I was on the board and Brian was still on the board. I don't know if those uh, RFPs came in. I don't know how many they got. So they are, but, yeah, they are, uh, uh, but I think they came in. Before I was on board, you know, the um, all dispatchable RFP controversy was after you were already there. Second term, in fact, I think. No. Well, we can go back and look, but it you definitely know, wasn't Brian. Do you want me to go see? Yes, please. That was the ask. Okay. Is there anything else, Councilor? Yeah, so. Yeah. It's so no, so we have about two minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it oh, seven? It is Six fifty nine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We are disbanded.